had an interesting question posed to me not very long ago. Somebody said, I was raised on Chapel Hill Street. Where were you raised? <laughs> I was raised on Bourbon Street uh, <laughs> in another place, a town well known to you. Actually, we had an apartment not uh, just right on the other side, just parallel to Bourbon, on Burgundy. Burgundy, you all know that particular place. Anyway, my life was touched by my father's life. My father was a nightclub entertainer. And many of you know that. Some of you said, you forgot to tell that other part of the story this morning. When I went into the ministry, I told my daddy about it. And he said, my God, son, there's no future in it. <laughs> <laughs> but he was a very good man. I learned a lot of things. And somewhere down there during those years in the quarter, either I learned this from somebody else or it was original. I'm not so sure. But there was a song that I was requested to sing from time to time. Can you believe that? Uh, that I was requested to sing from time to time. <laughs> anyway, the song goes something like this. This guy, he comes along. He sings a real bad song. He tells this girl wrongs right. Then he tells her right. Uh, uh, tells the girl's wrongs right. Tells her that right's wrong. She lets him sing a while. Then she looks him in the face and she says to him, My brother, what you're saying is a disgrace. Are you listening to me? And he said, Uh-huh. And she said, Something's got to stay. And something's got to go. But this one thing, my friend, I really think that you ought to know you got the right string, daddy, but you got the wrong yo-yo. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what you call, sure enough, crazy, huh? You know. But you know what? With regard to the life of faith, sometimes I think some of us have the right string and the wrong yo-yo. And as we look at the scripture today, let's see if that's not the truth. In my former book, Theophilus, this is Luke, Dr. Luke, who has written a two-volume thing, Luke and Acts. I wrote about all that Jesus did and uh, did do and teach until the day he was taken up into heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles that he had chosen. Remember, um, Matthias became an apostle later and Paul later, which means that God continues to baptize people with special opportunities and responsibilities. After his suffering, he showed himself to many men and gave many convincing proofs that he was still alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Um, 541 eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Christ, according to the other passages of Scripture. On one occasion, while he was still eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father has promised, which you heard me speak about. John baptized with water, but in a few days, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And so when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, It's not for you to know the times or dates the father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes to you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria, Samaria and to all the ends of the earth. It's okay to be a witness to the Jews, to your chosen family, but to Judea, to the Gentile world, to Samaria, the completely rejected and unloved world, great guns. Not that. Oh, yeah. After this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him out of their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside him. Men of Galilee, why do you stand there looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. The word of God for the people of God. God. We've got the right string and the wrong yo-yo if we think that Easter is once a year, one day, one Sunday. The Easter reality is the fact that the God who was with us in the person of Christ in the flesh is the God who is with us at all times and in all places as long as time endures, now and forevermore. For 33 years, he visited with us in human flesh, and in him somehow the mystery of the fullness of God was made known in his life, through his life, in his deeds, throughout his deeds. But that was a limited experience. And the truth is that all flesh is grass and will eventually wither. And so we have the assurance, the assurance that while he came to us to identify fully with what it means to be a human being in a world like ours with people just like you and me, at the same time, he did not want to leave us without assistance when the time came for him to go. And so he said, I'm going to be leaving you in the flesh. 
but I will be present with you in another way. The amazing and wonderful truth about Jesus is that you could not in any way crucify him on a Calvary, stick him in a grave, and expect him to stay there. It was not the nature of his reality. And so he, in resurrection, confirms the fact that not only is Easter a continuing reality, but that Easter is also God's resurrection day for any of us who will participate in its reality. And the other thing is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We all need to be empowered. We all need to know that God is able. We all need to know that God can do what we cannot do. And so here comes the Holy Spirit. It's the presence of the Creator. You feel it. It's the presence of the Redeemer, Christ. You sense it. It's the presence of something fresh and new that keeps on reminding us that the Creator continues to create, the Redeemer continues to save, and somehow is with us in a brand new way. It's the baptism not just of water, but the baptism that comes of fire, which is the Holy Spirit, for fire illumines and fire warms and fire sometimes even cooks. And may it cook all of that bad stuff out of us so that the good stuff could be left uh, there are many kinds of baptism. There's the baptism of water. Uh, this last week, one of the guys that uh, took off to get his life in a better place, he's in recovery right now, uh, caught me at the door on the way out uh, after we were doing the Monday's health clinic, and he said, you know, um, I, when I get back, I want to be baptized. And he said, I want to be baptized with a lot of water. He said, are you willing to do that? I said, baby, you tell me how much you need, and we'll see to it that it is provided for you, you know. And he said, well, I just thought you baptized with a little water. Don't get us wrong, folks. We'll baptize you with as little or as much as you need because baptism is not a matter of water. It's a matter of spirit. That's exactly what Jesus said. I'm going to leave you, but I'm going to leave in my place something a lot more important and a lot more significant and a lot more able than you are. And so what we need to recognize is that as he comes to us, that we are not only enabled to deal with our stuff, we are also empowered to deal with our stuff. And there's so many illustrations of that. Um, Camille was up here uh, as the lay minister a week or so ago, and she was talking about the pine tree and uh, how the pine tree has a taproot, and by itself, it's pretty fragile if you get a hard, hard wind. But if they stand close to each other, they become a kind of a forest, a mighty army, a kind of a fortress, a kind of a wall that stands firm. Uh, and last night... At 2.30, quarter to 3 this morning when we were coming in from the house, I just stood there in the dark with the ambient light and saw these three pine trees hugging one another and thought, this is Father, this is Son, this is Holy Spirit, this is the people of God acting like the church of God ought to be. This is when the strengthening comes, the power to deal, the enabling reality. And so we'll talk more about the Holy Spirit next Sunday because that's Pentecost. But what a beautiful thing to know that Pentecost is not the day that the Holy Spirit came and doesn't come anymore, but that Easter is the truth of the God who came and who stays, of the God who comes and the God who comes again. And that brings us to that particular point when it says, are you going to restore the kingdom right now? I suppose every single one of us would like to have a certain economic or, po or political or social restoration of some kind. We'd like for the world to be the way we want the world to be. But the fact is that the world is the way God wants it to be. And the fact is that God is still God over the world. And with regard to these kinds of things, you know, we have people. Have you, have you already heard it? The floods in Nashville, the oil spill out there. God help all of us. Um, the tornadoes, the hurricanes, uh, the disasters of all kinds. And people say it's got to be the end of time. Jesus is going to return very soon. Uh, these, this is the proof of that. You know, we've been saying that for a long time. Let me say two things about it. First thing is, are you ready if he comes? That's something I have to ask myself a lot of times. Are you ready to meet God? But the second thing about that is they don't know. You know, the scripture is real clear. And why do we get so uptight about it? You know, I'm not going to talk about you all, but somebody told me the world is going to end, you know, on May the 21st at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and that's the word of God. God told me that, you know. Uh, well, if God didn't tell Jesus, I don't think God told that person, you know, him or her. But you know what's so bad about me? I always breathe a lot better at 3 o'clock on that particular afternoon, <laughs> you know, 
But at the same time, we certainly do want to be ready. And you know, what is all this talk about the fact about uh, he is going to come again? What it is is simply this. Listen, the one who made promises with us made promises that he would be with us after he was gone in the flesh, and he keeps his promise. And so he will somehow, some way, in some circumstance, known to God, come again to complete the work that he intends and to do for us what he can and he alone can do. But hold on, because you got the right string with the wrong yo-yo if you think that he is not going to be present and is not going to restore and is not going to come again. And then finally, one last thing, and that's this. Uh, why do you stand there looking into the sky? The same Jesus who was with you uh, will come again and take you the way you've seen him go into heaven. You know, one of the things that's interesting about us, we just need to be about the Father's work. We need to keep on uh, keeping on and doing the things that God puts on our minds and hearts, but we need to remember to let God be God. I don't believe that any one of you in the church ever wrote a term paper uh, that was just overnight. You always made long, careful preparation of all the papers you wrote <laughs> in high school and in college and all that kind of stuff, you know. Uh, some of us could be, I gotta, I gotta tell you, I have a resentment about our Spanish class. Incidentally, our Spanish class is gonna be taking a break pretty soon. Uh, you know, most of the people in our Spanish class do their homework. That really ticks me off. Uh, <laughs> You know, and the bad thing about it is a lot of times what I want to do is look in the back of the book and get the little, the little quick answer from the back of the book. But that's not the way you learn a new reality. That's not the way you learn a new culture. That's not the way you learn a new knowledge. It takes time. It takes effort. And it, 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 ta it takes an understanding that you have got to take your responsibility along the way. But anyway, what we sometimes forget is that God is God and that God is in charge and that God is ultimate ruler. God is overall and majestic ruler and king. And, uh, boy, it's so easy to forget that. You know, and so in one of my term papers, you know, one of my teachers wrote a real sweet thing. I won't even grade this trash. Try it again. <laughs> That'll lift your heart and refine your education. The uh, other one that wrote, well, he said, this is very, very interesting. And he said, and you're full of theological wisdom and you're full of amazing religious philosophy, but you need to learn one lesson, and that is to let God be God. And I think a lot of times that's what you want to do. I did it yesterday afternoon when we realized we were in trouble. I got back into my magic prayer concerns. God, don't let this happen. God stopped this right here. God stopped this right now, and it didn't happen. And so many times, I know you've been there, and you've said, I wonder if God's around. I wonder if God hears. I wonder if God knows. I wonder if God cares. God hears. God knows and God cares. And God is still God in life, in death, when it goes well, when it goes badly, when you're on the top of things and when you're on the lowest ebb, God is still the God who is working together for good, to each and every one of us who love him and who are trying to respond to the wonderful presence of his Holy Spirit. God is with us. God is for us. God is present. God is God. My granddaddy, I'm named for him. His name was Keith Sawyer, S-A-W-E-R. And he had cancer of the tummy. And he was a man of amazing faith. He was an Anglican Christian. Wouldn't it be nice if we could start referring to one another as Methodist Christians or Baptist Christians or just Christian Christians, you know, instead of being unkind to each other? I'm sick and tired of churches being unkind to one another. and I'm sick and tired of Christians acting like a bunch of pagans that don't know anything about the spirit of Jesus. And that includes me <laughs> because there are times when I do it and I never am proud of it. But my grandfather was probably the most gentle, deep, uh, loving, spiritual man uh, in my young years. Uh, Mama's stepdaddy, the only daddy she ever knew. And uh, he ended up with us, a very wealthy man at one time, owned a steamship line all around the world. And, uh, but he ended up with us, he died with 36 cents in his wallet. I know because they gave it to me after he died. But I was 11 years old. And uh, he had the front bedroom of the house. I slept on a little couch because that's where we put Grandpa. And he called me one day and he said, son. And I said, yes. And he said, would you get me my Bible? And I said, sure, Grandpa. And he said, I've just finished my uh, bath. And he said, I'm awfully weak. And he said, if you'll help me get into my robe and in the bed. And I did. We got him in the bed. And he said, now open the Bible to Psalm 27. 
And so I started flipping through the Bible, and I found Psalm 27. He said, read me the first line to be sure that you've got the right place. The Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my strength, the strength of my life, my strong and continuous fort. And he said, that's correct. He said, now give it to me. And I gave him the Bible, and he turned it upside down, and he put it across the wound on his tummy where the cancer was. And he said, will you close the blinds? And I said, yes. And he said, would you go get your mother? And I said, why? He said, because I'm not going to be able to tell her goodbye. But I want you to tell her for me. And I did. And when we came, he was gloriously, quietly gone. That's not a sob story to make anybody have feelings. That's a story of the affirmation of our faith that anybody who thinks that Easter is one day a year or that the Holy Spirit can't do for us what needs to be done or that the kingdom of God isn't God's work and God's design and God's rule and not ours has simply got maybe the right string, but definitely the wrong yo-yo. Amen.